she, if she needs any introduction. Um, Molly's been one of those people who has placed definition on green economics, uh, really from, it seems to me, I'm sure she would disagree with us, almost from the genesis of the discipline. Um, so she's one of the kind of founding mothers of the, of, uh, of the, of the, um, the school of thought, uh, particularly in academia. And you may know her most as a, a member of the European Parliament, uh, Labour mentor perhaps by some of us. Um, but actually, um, currently her main occupation is in, in academia. And I believe I'm right in saying Molly as uh, Professor of Green Economics at Roehampton University. Um, so a very good uh, qualification to speak to us today. Uh, one book that she wrote, and she's quite a prolific author, uh, um, 2011 she wrote Envi Environment and Economy, which uh, covers a whole range of topics which really bear on um, the, com the complex range of things that we're going to be looking at today. Taxi, regulation, pollution, resource depletion, growth, globalisation and climate change. And one cannot hear that word growth at the moment <laughs> with a, with a, without a certain resonance. Um, and actually, I was tempted to say you can this morning to, to everybody here, and only and to you, um, welcome to the Anti-Growth Coalition. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud to be a member, but I'm, I'm a little disappointed, I think, that it's been turned into a culture war issue. Uh, because one had hoped that it would be one area where the culture war would have been uh, One of the qualifications that Molly brings this morning is as a member of the Association of Heterodox Economic Economists, I believe. Uh, anyone who's heterodox uh, always has a, a, a gold star. Uh, Molly, uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing from you and uh, I, if I may, I'd like to hand over to you and the slides that you prepared for us. And thank you again for putting yourself out uh, in such difficult circumstances. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And let me say at the beginning, as somebody who um, I'm, I'm grandma once a week now on Fridays, and I also teach a class of international students, so I've accepted the fact that I will probably be ill consistently until Christmas, so <laughs> every virus along the way is going to come my way, it seems to me. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm really sorry I can't be with you in person because it would be great to have the, the comradeship and the companionship and the solidarity on this journey that we're on that can sometimes feel quite isolating. But I think the other thing that we all acknowledge is that, as you pointed out, the sort of really stable, one might even say boring world that we were living in when Fukuyama wrote The End of History with extraordinary hubris um, has quite clearly come to an end. And we're living in a world that is much more unpredictable. And I think, in a way, the positive side is that in spite of train strike and virus, we are actually able to present to you. And I think we've learned to be resilient to these strange changes. And I I see one of my roles as an educator, certainly to, to, to prepare people for a world where things are unpredictable and we have to find solutions that we might not have expected to find. And actually it turns out we're, we're very good at that as we learned from COVID. So maybe there's a little glimmer of hope there. Right, I'm going to share my slides now. So, hopefully people can <clears throat> see those. Yeah. I actually took this picture, I was at the Land Workers Alliance in the summer, and uh, I had to present something about land, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and I had this lovely box of kale, and when I saw it there on my slides, I thought you'd enjoy having that shared with you as well, because I really think what yeah. we're talking about today is the extraordinary pleasure and delight we can actually take in things that you might consider to be simple. I think actually the complexity we're living with now is undermining our human contentment and in fact our psychological well-being, whereas a, a delightful box of kale like that or the kind of things I could see at the farmer's market here in town if I was energetic enough to go and visit, you know, to bring me an enormous sense of satisfaction. And uh, I, I called this presentation, when John asked me what I was going to call it, I called it Rethinking 
security for peace and justice. And then when I reread that, I thought, oh, that is a bit political, isn't it? It feels a bit heavy. So I've put joy in there as well. And, you know, also in line with the theme of the conference. But I've got to say, I'm going to find it quite hard to communicate joy this morning, but I'm sure you can make up for that at that end. So I am going to start with some fairly I mean, they are grim. They are also the reality. They're the sort of parameters we're working with here when we try to establish why we want to find joy in enough and what, what enough actually looks like. And so I'm starting with this um, diagram of the safe operating systems for planet Earth. And um, I've chosen this picture because it's quite easy to to understand and quite pleasant to look at. I don't know um, what the numbers are. It's not to me about the necessarily the scientific exactitude of what we're looking at here. It's just the fact that we know that in all these parameters that govern our ability to live on this planet, we are creeping beyond safe limits on most of them that we know about. And some of them we are already massively in the red as it were and um i think you you can see their genetic diversity i mean i think we're particularly thinking there about loss of species the nitrogen cycle is completely thrown out the phosphorus cycle because of intensive farming um, is completely out of kilter as well you can see actually climate change is is not in the most alarming state yet, even though we're seeing the consequences of that, according to this graphic anyway. But we know that we have to live within these safe operating systems if we're going to have um, a long term life on Earth. And it's, oh, getting feedback now. That's okay. Um, so it's quite interesting actually becoming a grandma because we often talk, don't we, about grandparents and. Um, I think I was actually committed to future generations before I had one of my own, so it hasn't really changed me, but at least I can talk about grandparents with a little more inside knowledge. But that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about the way we live now, making it impossible for future generations to have any kind of habitable planet. Um, and again, something that we can come to in, in discussions or in q and A. I I always personally find it infuriating when people go off and try and find other planets to live on it's kind of like mm. we've got this most amazing and beautiful planet here which we're destroying what would be the point of seeking you know other planets somewhere out there certainly not until we've learned to, to, to deal with our own with respect and care so that's one important point and that's really about limits and that's why i need to move on to this second point because it's it's obvious isn't it that once you stop expanding beyond those limits, the question about how what you produce in your economy is shared becomes much more urgent. And this relates back to the, the point about growth. And this this is I'm I'm now going to be the opposite of Liz Truss, which you won't be surprised to hear. But you know, her point is very much, oh, don't worry about how much you've got. Just let's make it let's make it bigger. Let's make that pie bigger for everybody. And then, you know, and then we'll all get more. And of course, we know that that's just not possible. And also, it's not desirable philosophically, I think, to to keep to say, um, we won't worry about inequality. We'll just make sure there's so much that everybody's got as much as they want. It's kind of part of the other side of the greed is good equation, in my view. And quite a few Tory ministers are on record saying that inequality is a good thing because it spurs us to this action. We should be competitive with each other. <clears throat> and this is very much the, the, the false ideology of economics that I've tried to challenge with my idea of green economics. So once we stop increasing the size of the pie, which we have to do because of busting those limits I showed on the previous slide, then we have to focus much more on how the pie is actually being shared out. And we know that not only it are the, the the higher income groups receiving much a much larger share that that level of inequality is actually growing as well and i think this is a an important point this third point here that closing the planetary frontier <coughs> requires an urgent focus on economic justice and that's why, why i make that connection between what you might call sustainability um living within the boundaries of the planet and the need for economic justice this is why I was actually teaching my students when they gave me this virus this, is this week. This is um, Branka, Branka Milanovic's elephant graph. And um, 
I think it's a brilliant piece of work, actually. So what he's done to produce this graph, obviously the green is just like entertainment, but the blue is actual data plotting. And what he's done is like, he worked at the World Bank and um, he took um, household income diaries for people right across the world. So he wasn't interested what country they were living in. He was just interested in which people have benefited from that process of globalization over that decade. And so he's plotted them here. You can see the, the um, horizontal axis is percentiles of the income distribution. In other words, each he's actually plotted them for every 5% of the income distribution. He's plotted how much those people have seen a growth in their income, percentage growth in their income. So <clears throat> this is actually a slightly more encouraging graph, I would say, because the highest point there, the 80% increase in income growth is people at the 50th percentile. In other words, people across the world are more or less on average incomes. The sad news is that the very poorest people haven't benefited at all. Perhaps they're subsistence farmers, people that haven't become sort of sucked into this. And of course, this is financial data as well. So it doesn't tell you anything about quality of life you might have if you're an indigenous person living in the Amazon. And that's another really important point to note in terms of the theme of our conference. But anyway, we can see that the very wealthiest have seen a huge benefit almost as much as people on average incomes. That's the, the elephant's trunk over on the right there. And of course, you know, this is percentage income. So those people already had massive incomes and they've seen huge increases in those incomes. And that's why inequality is increasing. Anyway, as I always say to my students, I'm sort of at the bottom of the elephant's trunk there in higher education, actually having seen a 30% fall in my income over the past decade and um, lots more work as well. Um, but anyway, those people there are the sort of 70 to 80% richest people in the world. And they, we have seen a huge, uh, have seen no increases basically through the process of globalization. Anyway, I think this is quite useful context. You know, who's who's really benefited as we've seen this economic model spread across the world? Very good work here as well by Hans Rosling in terms of a lot of people have been taken out of absolute poverty. And I think we need to recognize that as critics of this system of constant growth. I, I always feel I need to I need to make note of that because a lot of people have come into a situation where they have electricity and water and education and those basic requirements because this you know this is what we mean by economic justice here's another aspect of the problem we need to to take seriously M more data but i don't need to go into it in great detail because <clears throat> this is about the justice of, of the climate crisis because the people who have created the climate not the people who are bearing the brunt. So you can see here that the US and the EU essentially are responsible for vast amounts of CO2 emissions. And the UK actually are, ourselves, we have a very large historic burden because of having gone through the Industrial Revolution driven by coal before anybody else. And, um, you know, the, the so-called workshop of the world that required a lot that was powered by coal and that coal produced carbon dioxide emissions and then the US took over with its massive economy fueled by fossil fuels and uh, so this is this is an important graphic when we talk about who's responsible for the climate crisis and who should be paying for um, climate well climate reparations I think but at least for adaptation and mitigation of the consequences of the climate crisis and here's the depressing reality about who's really suffering. Um, obviously, the, the countries that are suffering most of all are those that will disappear altogether, the small island states that contribute less than 1% of greenhouse gases, but are, I mean, it says badly impacted, but they, they live very close to sea level. We can think about the Solomon Islands or the Pacific Islands generally, and those countries are inevitably now going to, to cease to exist as a consequence of the historic emissions that I just showed you. We've got countries, you can see this is from Bangladesh here, this picture. Um, over 8 million people affected by floods in 2019. We haven't got the figures yet for the floods this year, but every year it gets worse. A lot of Bangladesh is very low lying. It's in the it's in a river delta and it, it's large, you know, maybe half the country is, is under flood water every year now. Extraordinarily, I have a couple of students from Bangladesh in my class and they don't know anything at all about climate change, which I found really quite shocking. Most of the Asian students are not learning about this in school. 
Anyway, they're obviously learning about it in my class, so that's one benefit, I suppose, of, of coming to study in the UK, but it's really quite uh, surprising to me. It's the, the British students know far more. And then you've got people living in countries where climate change is making their own countries uninhabitable. I'm just using the example here of the Horn of Africa, where changing weather patterns means they've got persistent drought and um, acute food insecure population was 27 million. I mean, I'm sure that estimate is out of date now. We're seeing the same in Mali. There are lots of areas of the world where the rains are just no longer coming there because of um, changing weather patterns and those people's lives are becoming impossible. So some of the things we need to do about that, I've mentioned already the idea of climate reparations, and I think this is a key factor in terms of climate justice, economic justice. You probably heard at the Glasgow COP a lot of discussion around loss and damage, and that is the, the phrase that's used to describe the impacts on um, countries, and as I've said, they're the countries least responsible for the climate crisis. Now, that hasn't been taken seriously at all in global climate negotiations. It was finally on the agenda in Glasgow, and there was an agreement that it would be resolved at Sharm El Sheikh COP27 that's coming next month. So I think we all need to keep our focus on that and pressure on that and make sure that that is finally resolved. And not only is it acknowledged that we're responsible for this loss of damage, but we're also we also take responsibility for funding the, the, the reparations that are necessary. There's a risk here which I'm drawing attention to that what might be done is just to, um, instead of dealing with this injustice, we create more injustice. For example, some of the financial um, proposals involve buying land in low income countries and then setting them aside or planting trees there or using them as carbon sinks and then displacing people who are subsistence. So we have to be very alert to the fact that there's a risk of recolonization of those areas or by either corporations or wealthy nations. I mentioned as well that some of these packages include technology transfer, free technology transfer, solar panels and so on. We should certainly remove uh, intellectual property controls over the kind of technology that these countries need to make the transition to sustainable future. But there, there was a very interesting package agreed in Glasgow where um, the UK and I think it was Germany as well contributed to a major um, renewable energy programme for South Africa, ensuring that they would not need to burn fossil fuels to provide people with electricity. And that's the sort of thing that's a model, I think. So, yeah, we, we are, I suppose, well, we are proudly part of the anti-growth coalition, although, of course, in in we were talking in one of my Green Party meetings the other day and saying it would be really embarrassing that if our policies for home expansion and you know, massive expansion of renewables were followed through, we would see an enormous amount of economic growth and we'd have to be all embarrassed about that. So, you know, I think we need to, to bear in mind that actually, um, you know, we, we need to completely change the way our economy works. So I think rather than say... <coughs> It's about quality, not quantity. That's the most important thing. And we obviously need a lot more renewable energy and a lot more home insulation and <clears throat> various sectors like that need to expand. But we, what we don't need is people sitting in call centres persuading other people to fly abroad for a foreign holiday. So, yeah, it's about changing the way the economy works rather than the size of it. And of course, that also requires us to rethink what we think a good life is all about and to, to challenge this connection between work and survival. Because at the moment, if you, you know, if we were to suggest, oh, you know, we our economy should be half the size it is, people would immediately say, oh, but then people will ha not have jobs. That that sort of people need to to have some people need to have enough money to um, have comfortable lives, and that's why you could suggest a universal basic income, and they need to have a sense of purpose and so on. But they don't need to have an economy that creates destructive jobs that threaten our futures. Um, anyway, that's a huge issue. I haven't got really time to go into. But as I'm saying here, what we're talking about with a green economy is fewer material products, but stronger communities, better quality jobs, warmer homes, less stress, closer connection to nature. So it's really focusing on those quality of life issues rather than financial, um, rather than the size of the economy measured in financial terms. I think it's really important as well as we go through this transition to remember that we're talking about a total system change 
I find it really frustrating that I can't get my work funded because all the pots of money that are around research into climate change are always focused on technological innovation. But actually, the, the fastest and easiest way to reduce our energy impacts is social innovation. And the best example you can use for that is the fact that if you look at the fact that the government is saying by 2035, you can't buy a, a, a fossil fuel <coughs> um, powered vehicle, private vehicle. The response that's being suggested to that is, oh, well, we'll all switch to electric cars then. But actually, electric cars themselves have large environmental impacts and you know, embodied energy in the car, but also a lot of pollution involved in uh, driving the car, throwing out little particles and so on. Plus, you know, you're still using energy, plus you need to keep the road system going. So there's a lot of energy invested in that compared to public transport, which would, you know, massively reduce the energy impact of your transport system. There's a reason why communist countries focus on public transport, and it was because it was the cheapest and easiest way to move around a lot of people. And if that's your priority, which it should be, public transport would be your choice. So I think this idea of modal shift, obviously not to use that phrase when you're talking with your hairdresser, but the idea that it's not about a changing one technology for another technology is actually rethinking the way we provide for these necessary services is, is very important. So there's some examples here. Um, when I say different models of ownership, I mean, for example, a car club rather than private car use. You can see here this lovely um, cycling bus that they have in the Netherlands. I mean, would be lovely to have those, probably not in Stroud. The kids would never get up the hills here, but in uh, lots of cities you could have those, especially if you had, as they have in the Netherlands, cycleways, you know, where there's no possibility of, of running into other traffic. And so the children can get some exercise on their way to school, have some fun. Um, and yeah, it's also a, obviously a social <coughs> activity rather than just a practical one. Reconnecting local supply chains, I think that's obvious as well. We're building in this need for energy when we're, um, the way we run our food system with huge supermarkets and food traveling large distances and move, you know, not respecting um, local seasonal produce and so on. So here's another thing where a really appalling situation is, is offering a chance for us to really rethink um, rethink how we run our economy and how we power our economy. And this is another area that's, you know, very politically salient right now because the appalling war, which I'm sure has devastated us all, um, has pointed out our dependence on fossil fuels. And actually more than pointing out our dependence on Russian fossil fuels, it's pointed out the fact that most fossil fuels come from really unsavory uh, countries governed by very unsavory regimes. We call this the the resource curse. You know the the, the fact that having uh, in in an economy that where fossil fuels are so vital, controlling them becomes um, really a, a, a real focus of political effort, and very often that becomes authoritarian. So when Putin stopped it you know when we no longer were going to import uh oil from putin we then looked to the gulf states or saudi or you know a whole load of other unsafe regimes obviously no exception to this rule <laughs> i get my i get my students to do a sort of competition who won from globalization and this week one of them picked norway and i try very hard to pick holes and say no but on the other hand this and that but i can't find anything i, I think norway is definitely going to win top of the human development index largest sovereign wealth fund in the world if only we'd done that in this country anyway this is i th i love this poster which was done by the the green the green group in the european parliament it actually works very well in French, where isolate and insulate is the same word. But anyway, even in, in English, it works very nicely. And I like the sort of social realist style they've used as well. But effectively, it's a very simple message, isn't it? The way to, to isolate Putin is to make sure that your home is well insulated and you don't need Russian fossil fuels. I actually saved my money when I was an MEP, knowing that I would come back and have my own home retrofitted. And I actually turned my heat pump on the day Putin went into Ukraine, <coughs> completely by coincidence. And it has been incredible how much 
how, how little, I mean, I'm off gas now, but how little electricity I need as well. But what's appalling about that in terms of my economic justice point is the fact that I was able to save the money to do that. Whereas what we need is this massive <coughs> home retrofit program publicly funded so that it's the people on the lowest incomes who don't need to pay their bills. I mean, we have a slogan now, you know, the, the, the cheapest bill is the one you don't have to pay. It's completely obvious, isn't it? But um, it's people like me that don't have to pay their bill because I've got a very well insulated home, whereas people on the lowest incomes are, you know, living in terrible leaky homes. So anyway, this home insulation, there couldn't be a more important message. But also moving beyond renewables, <laughs> like I said, now we've got a We've got a horrible tussle now where um, the government is trying to persuade us that the answer to this is to is to develop the fossil fuel reserves that are still there. And um, extraordinary through the looking glass kind of statements about how, you know, this is low carbon fossil fuel because, you know, we haven't brought it here in a ship. And, uh, so we're in the middle of this tussle right now, and I think we have to focus very strongly on the need for renewables. They can be um, installed so much more quickly and also to, you know, that will not be subject to these sort of um, price rises and OPEC negotiations and so on. They'll be, they'll be ours, they'll be here, they'll be secure. And of course, also, I mean, this is where I get very nerdy about technology, but, you know, balancing the grid, storage, smart use of energy and so on. And the thing about the energy crisis is autumn is it's made people think about all these things. <clears throat> it's made people think about, I mean, you've probably heard people saying, oh, I have to put on a jumper in my house. And you're kind of thinking, yes, I'm, I'm glad you've done that now because you could have been doing that the whole time and turning your thermostat down and all sorts of other things people are learning about how to use energy efficiently, which we needed to know anyway. I suppose one of the longer term questions is what, you know, how will we move from this, period of, of excessively high energy prices into a future of still high fossil fuel prices um, and a sort of smooth transition there so we don't see energy prices be fossil fuel prices anyway becoming so low that people go back to to profligate use of fossil fuels oh sorry that's a bit odd isn't it let me switch that off there we are right i just wanted to say something about land as well um because it's another resource that's crucially important in ensuring in ensuring justice, really. Um, often not, not discussed, but if you think about the need for secure supplies of locally grown food, then you realise that, that this issue of land is very important and we shouldn't neglect it. Also, of course, it ties in with another area where Jesus was right, so I always like to mention those. And... The biblical notion of jubilee is surprisingly well known. Not everybody knows that it was about partly about resting the land, so no crops to be sown or harvested. But it's also the other side of it was that debts had to be cancelled. So there was a sort of understanding five thousand years ago that um, you know that wealth accumulates wealth, and this is a really important principle. Um, and so you have to find ways within your economic system of redistributing that wealth, land wealth and financial wealth. And so every 49 years, um, all families that had become poor and had mortgaged their land could return to possession of that land. So people who'd been successful or, you know, for, or fortunate might have accumulated an unfair share of land, but then it was understood that it needed to be shared fairly again. And we have never had this sort of land reform and land distribution in in the UK I and mean, effectively we're living with the consequences of the land distribution that was undertaken after 1066 so we had a feudal system you know from doomsday that land was reallocated then or sort of stolen from Saxons and given to Normans and since then we've had this bizarre system of aristocracy and land holding and, and wealth ownership through land you can see here I think this is I'm going to say this is the Philippines, but people protesting for land reform and so many countries in the world have had these land reforms and it's really about time we had one in this country so that the land is allocated not to people who are profiting from it, but people who want to, to work it, to grow vegetables, to, to provide for local people. Am I running out of time?
So you're looking nervously. Um, no, that's all right. I was being waved at. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't remember how many more I've got. It can't be that many now. So I mentioned already the need to rethink the good life and to measure economic success by well-being and not by growth. We also need to think about measuring stocks rather than flows. So Herman Daly famously said that under the current way of measuring the economy, if you cut up the whole of the native forest in the US and turned it into um, gambling chips, you know, you'd be ahead because you would be able to sell those in a market. And this is a, an absolutely crucial error with the way we measure our economy by GDP. We need to focus on, on life rather than work. So we need to provide people with a, a basic income that, that they have so they can make different decisions about how they share their time or sell their labor. We need to move towards a, a circular economy rather than a linear economy. So we're not just taking energy and resources in, making a, a product and then just throwing it onto a waste dump at the end of the day. And I think we have learned about this from COVID. We have learned about different values um, and what we really value. And one of the things that came out of it most strongly was the need, the, the value we find in green spaces. People who had gardens cope so much better. People who could get to local green spaces and uh, obviously people have made decisions about that. A million people my age have left the labor force. They're just prioritizing quality of life over income. And many people have left cities, <coughs> moved into rural areas to, to be able to get this connection with nature. I'm just gonna do the bioregional economy and then I'll stop. So the bioregional economy was like my proposal for how we might rethink our economy. And it's a very simple proposal. It's just trying to prior, it's trying to maximize well-being, human well-being, but not ignoring other species, um, while minimizing the use of energy and resources. And we have a little phrase we like to use here in Stroud, which is, we're lambies looking after my backyard rather than nimbies. And obviously, if everybody looks after their backyard, then we're protecting the whole planet. Just wanted to, to discuss this in connection with Somerset because I'm coming on to Glastonbury in a sec, but a, a bioregion is, as it says here, a life place. And so you define it in terms of hydrological and ecological characteristics, because our, our local political boundaries really don't make any sense. Um, very often the rivers are actually the, the dividing lines, whereas in bioregions, you often use the watershed as your um, definition of what is a reasonable area to consider your, your home. And this could be provide the basis for a, a planning system and an economic organization system that begins from, from natural forms rather than from artificial political structures. As it says here, bioregional economy would acknowledge ecological limits and it should be largely self-sufficient in terms of basic tools. I just I developed this idea of trade subsidiarity, which means you would begin in your local area. If you have a need, you would begin with local provisioning and only look further afield if you couldn't provide for your need locally. And that would involve, oh, I fancy a piece of fruit. Oh, I can get an apple in Stroud. I can't get a pineapple in Stroud. I, I should probably eat the apple, except in situations of luxury. I love pineapples, by the way. But obviously, you know, you need to think differently in terms of um, large and complex manufacturing such as aeroplanes or computers or whatever and the, the the question is what what is the size of economy it makes sense to manufacture these goods i just wanted to mention this picture on the front of my book here because i you know if you've written a book they send you lots and lots of photos that you could include and um i chose this picture because you can just see as that person touches the wheat the hairs on their arm sort of rising up and that connection and i think that's some for me, what by and you may know that they've now. You, I don't know if you remember that scene in Gladiator where he's walking through the wheat field. He used to be able to do that, but they've now bred wheat so that it's really low, so that it doesn't get battered by wind and rain. And so you'd have to, you know, be crawling through the wheat field in order to experience this. I'm not sure what I make about that, make of that, but it's you wouldn't get a photo like that anymore. I think. Anyway, just to finish, a little bit of stuff about how this might change us and our connection with nature and our sense of joy. 
somebody, I'm not sure who invented this idea of nature deficit disorder, but as, as part of a sort of syndrome of mental dis-ease that we're suffering because of our lack of connection to our, our natural places. And it rather reminded me of this quotation from Wordsworth that getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. You know, that the sort of potential we have as human beings, the vast potential we have in all sorts of spiritual, psychological, social and emotional ways are being sort of neglected while we just buy plastic gadgets and play computer games. And we need to find that sense of, of reconnection, what I call falling in love with your native soil. Some people don't like the word native. We can maybe argue about that later. But yeah, um, just connecting to your local place and having a sense of where you belong and that very tight connection with nature is offered really in my book as a substitute for gadget and novelty. So here's Glastonbury where I go every year. I don't usually spend much time down here. I usually spend all my time on the green fields but I did go down here to, to see Paul McCartney this year and I just think Glastonbury is, is such an example of the joy people have in human community. Obviously there's a lot of focus there on um, ensuring green lifestyles and at the same time it's hugely energy intensive but people do live in simplicity at Glastonbury as you'll know if you've been there and at the same time they experience great joy in the place and in each other and in that simple life that they have for a few days so I think it's quite an interesting example but also of course Glastonbury as a place is I mean is there something about the sort of spiritual history and resonance of Glastonbury that also brings people there. I represented Glastonbury as an MEP and it was, uh, well, there were many, many places in the West Country that I was very proud of. I also represented Stonehenge and Tintagel and so many magical places. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I just notice that people are drawn to Glastonbury by that need for a spiritual connection that they've lost in the sort of material and plastic world that, that's dominating at the moment. So I, I start, you know, I like to start a presentation sometimes with this quotation from a 60s song, we are stardust, we are golden, and we have to find our way back to the garden. You know, this is what we are as human beings. We're so diminished in this material consumption world. That song come, is about Woodstock, and Glastonbury obviously is a festival that was inspired by Woodstock. So, conclusion. I believe we are hedonists, but not sybarites. We do enjoy pleasure and there's nothing wrong with that but we're not interested in luxury and our, this desire to compete with others and to to purchase things as some kind of status symbol or keeping up with the joneses is manufactured and is actually extremely destructive and undermining of our well-being and the new ethic of consumption that we must develop can satisfy our essential human needs, which are not fundamentally material in my view. And it's that focus on material needs that has again threatened our well-being. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to finish with some quotations. I hope you don't mind. There is no wealth but life. I'm not such a huge fan of John Ruskin, actually, but I think this is a fantastic quotation. It's sort of to me, it's like the motto of the Green Economist. And and yeah, I think it says so much in so few words. The disenchantment of the world was a phrase that uh, Max Weber came up with to describe this sort of bureaucratic materialist culture, scientific actually, post-enlightenment culture that we're living with. And I suppose while we value science and the knowledge it's brought us, can we find a way to, to also recover that sense of the enchantment of the world? I'm recommending this book here, which is really powerful in terms of its suggestion that we have somehow lost that connection because of being a very literary society and how language has sort of distanced us from the world. I found it very, very interesting and um, really made me think. And finally, just to share with you this, which is part of a very short book of um, theology that we have as Quakers. I think it's 52 short paragraphs. And this is, this is one I particularly like. I mean, there's more to it than this, but this is the bit that really inspires me, which is that we should rejoice in the splendor of God's continuing creation. So I think along with there is no wealth but life, this is two inspiring slogans for us as people who want to find ways to ensure that we can flourish and find joy, but without destroying this very beautiful planet that is indeed God's continuing creation. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So um, what I'd like to suggest, if it's okay by you, Mom, is we take two or three questions together now. Uh, we might be able to do the same again the second time round, but um, uh, we'll see where they come from and where they converge, and over to you to, to, to see how you can uh, respond to them. So uh, there is a broken mic somewhere, I think you know. Uh, okay, I'll repeat the question when I hear it from the floor, yeah. Uh, so uh, the lady and the gentleman at the back, yeah. I'm Catherine, and um, it's a quite a quick question, uh, but slightly off the main thing. Going on to climate justice, Molly uh, mentioned that her Bangladesh students aren't aware of the climate crisis. And I wonder if she could quickly, I don't understand that, but she could understand the link. Um, are they aware that there is mass displacement of people in Bangladesh that don't make the correlation? Or are they unaware that, that sea levels are rising and people moving as a result? Yes, so um, uh, not to respond just yet, but that was about um, how um, how it is that people from Bangladesh that you highlighted uh, are not aware, but in what sense might they be aware but not have the tools to understand? And the reason the question understand. is that, that we hope to be Christian to advocates and have solidarity with, with causes. Yes, and what can we do? Uh, what does someone want to mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's a gentleman next to you. Um, as an economist, which I guess most of us aren't, uh, I'm, less, I'm not less interested in degrowth. And I wondered if Molly could explain for those people who are interested in degrowth what we would say to people who claim to be to instability. Thank you. Yeah, so, question on tea growth and what we'd say to people who um, claim it could lead to instability. I think that question of the transition is uh, it's a fundamental one with a lot of uh, green economic advocacy. Um, and Molly, of course, is actually quite a really experiment to be great, so I'm glad you've asked the question. Uh, and comment on it. Uh, my name is Colin. Um, I'd like to repeat the question that I asked last night, essentially. I'll try to be short. Um, what about cities? You know, most of the world population now, the majority are living in cities. Many of them are mega cities, 10 or 20 million people in incredibly dense environments. One economic argument is that cities are actually quite efficient because people are very close to each other, so uh, transport is short, you can get to hospitals, provide many services and so on, which you can't if everybody's spread out in a nice sort of Hobbit Shire rural idyll. Um, they don't have a mega hospital in the Shire, I think. Um, so how do we deal with reconnecting with nature and being local in terms of supply chain when Going forward over the next 10, 20, 50 years, most of the world population, as it reaches 10 million, are going to live in that kind of environment. Thank you. So that, this is around mega cities, and you know, obviously, many, most of the population in this country live in cities as well. How do we imagine them as being sustainable, and uh, how, what does local localization look like in the context of a mega city, which is something that we're going to have to live with for um, the foreseeable future? So, question there about on. Um, the, the awareness and how we stand alongside people in Bangladesh, uh, the, the, the instability that might arise from uh, degrowth um, policies and the localization, what localization looks like in the context of a mega city. Uh, Let me start with the third okay. one. Um, so, obviously, there's quite a lot of discussion about what is the most sustainable form of human community. And um, the way we've designed cities is very much dependent. I mean, they're the consequence of the fossil fuel era. So more than 50% of people globally lived in cities. I think we passed that maybe eight years ago, something like that. Um, so in this country, we moved out of rural areas several hundred years ago. That's a process that's continued now in the poorer countries of the world. Herbert Girardet has done some really interesting work on this, at least theoretically, where he has these three concepts. One is Agropolis, then he, the second one is Petropolis, and he, he then <clears throat> suggests the design of Ecopolis. Now, the, the mega cities of the world could not operate without the fossil fuels that they're using at the moment. They're sucking in resources and pushing out wastes. And that is not, I would suggest, an energy intensive way of organizing human societies. I take the point that people can, you know, that uh, mass transit systems are efficient and people live close to each other. But I think what's underestimated is the energy impact of running all those systems. 
I'm. I mean, this isn't my department, <laughs> urban design. But I would say that is the right question to ask. The question we have to ask, really, in all our different disciplines is, how do we um, design X to minimize the use of energy and resources? We're not doing that. We're not doing that when we build cities. The question we're asking is, how do we design X to maximize profit? And so, you know, it makes sense to drag poor people into slums and cities because they work in factories, they produce things, and then those things are exported and the profit's made. And so that's why changing the way we measure our economy and changing the motivation of our economy is crucially important because at the moment we are designing for failure. Um, a lot of the world's cities, yeah, they're not sustainable in the future we're looking at. So in, in Girardet's theoretical design of an urban settlement, it would be considerably smaller than the mega cities you're talking about. But it would it could still be quite a sizable city, but it would have food provisioning around. So but essentially be sort of concentric circles with people in the middle, then um, food provisioning, then textile and produce provisioning, then renewable energy and so on. Um, and, you know, that's his suggestion of a design for a sustainable settlement. I just wanted to say also about population. There's a really interesting report produced a couple of years ago that showed that the UN projections of population are wildly wrong. They're projecting, I think, 11 million by the middle of the century. And birth rates are already changing to such an extent that it's much more likely to be 9 billion. And um, the reasons for this are clear. As people, women, especially gain access to education and um, birth control and power, actually, they make decisions about family size and they decide to have much smaller families. So. I'm sure you know birth rates are below replacement ratio in most European societies now, like 1.4 in Italy. So, um, what is it here? Anyway, a bit higher than that. Aging populations, but not so many babies <coughs> being born. That pattern is now being followed in India as well and in Indonesia and some of the really populous countries of the world. So, yeah, um, I don't think we should frighten ourselves with this idea that there are going to be 11 billion people on the planet by 2050. It seems that that's not where the projections are going now. Um, yeah, this point about instability and anti-growth. I mean, I could just come back and say that the growth economy is creating massive instability, which it is. We're, we're living in a world with instability built in now. I think that's what we're all learning, whether it's impossibly hot summers or um, you know, floods or whatever else, we're, we're living with climate instability and that ultimately is going to be far more destructive than um, instability that's in a system that we do actually have the ability to redesign. The economy is a social system. We could change the way it works. We're just choosing at the moment not to do that. The big problem we've got here is is finance. We saw couple of weeks ago this was very weird the mini budget and the response to that because I would have known that um, you know what Kuateng did would have caused trouble on the financial markets because even in my humble role as finance and economy spokesperson for the Green Party I do consider what would happen if some of our proposals were you know if we were in government and we made some of our proposals and that's exactly what would happen speculative attack by financial markets effectively or loss of confidence in financial markets so um, yeah, I've worked quite a lot on regulation of financial markets and it's ridiculously lax. And this system that allows you to make money from money while creating no social value is a big part of the problem. And yeah, we allow financial markets to have a lot of power and that constrains the political decisions we can make. So we should do something about that. But at the same time, the you know that system is secondary to what's actually happening on our planet where we're, what we're doing with our economy is creating much greater instability and instability that is beyond our control in terms of climate breakdown um in terms of you know all of those things i showed you on the first graphic that is what real instability looks like and we're we're rushing headfirst towards that so the sort of economic and financial instability can be managed. It's not easy, but it's it's got to be managed because the real parameters that we're dealing with cannot be managed. Mm. And if we don't deal with the economic redesign, 
we're just going to run into more and more of those. I think more and more people are kind of realising this, actually. It's a shame they didn't realise it when it was only theoretical, but it's become real now. I mean, COVID's the same. COVID is another consequence of moving beyond these boundaries, you know, taking over spaces in the natural world that where other species inhabit and picking up their viruses effectively. So all of the, the crises that we're seeing are all generated by this economy growing out of control. And then on my Bangladeshi students, I'm not, I'm <coughs> quite tempted to do some research on this myself because I've got to say I was astonished. I had a really good student last year who was um, not himself from the Philippines, but his parents were from the Philippines. And he was really motivated and well-educated. He'd gone to school here and he knew a lot of stuff and he did the reading and so on. But when we got to the climate change thing, he, he said to me, oh, I had no idea the Philippines was so vulnerable to climate change. I kind of like what's going on there? I mean, like you say, maybe it is denial or fear of acknowledging what we're really dealing with here. But I think another answer may be if you think about the kind of people who can afford to pay £15,000 for a master's degree for their offspring, we are talking about the people who are benefiting from this system. So they're hardly going to want to think about the consequences of that system for planetary stability, climate stability, and so on. But most likely it's just poor poor you know poor design of education systems i don't know who's running the education system in bangladesh but yeah um maybe they weren't concentrating in class i don't know but i find the level of lack of knowledge quite astonishing and yeah at least i know yeah. I, I can make up for it week eight of my course they, by the end of that they will yeah. definitely know what's going on it, as you say maybe something to do with the sociology of the places that uh, the that the people that you're talking about came from because I know that in the Philippines there are very high levels of climate anxiety amongst young people mm. highest of any um, country that was surveyed in a big survey recently mm. oh do send me that I'd be interested to see that <laughs> okay yes we'll do um, um, but, but I think the the other thing that we've got to recall is you know that anxiety without a sense of what should be done or without a sense of agency you know is very destructive and perhaps that's also why people are going into denial if they live in countries where yeah. they don't feel they can do anything and we should also recall that in this you know how how recent is it that we've had climate change on the curriculum in this country probably 10 years yeah. at the most yeah. you know I remember arguing that young people in school should be taught about climate change and um, condemned for being political and so on so we're not preparing our young people for the world they're going to inhabit which yeah. is this world of instability and risk and um, constant change and so on. Well, thank you, Molly. Uh, I'm afraid our time is um, running out, um, and there won't be time at this stage for more questions for Molly. I'm afraid, Molly, there, there would have been plenty more to ask you, I'm sure. And well, I'm more. sure you can resolve these questions <laughs> yourselves in that room there. Um, I think what, you, what, what I certainly take away from what you heard is um, a need, uh, and this isn't just me reflecting, uh, a need to kind of recover some civic space for the kind of decisions that you're talking about to be to be made. It seems that all the uh, debate is being run by commercial interests at the moment, and that's particularly what we're seeing you've been in the last week, for instance, at the Conservative Party Conference. Um, and actually, the, the kind of place where you're, where the, the bi-regional solutions, for instance, which you're advancing, can be um, developed, really have to be in a completely different space altogether, not one uh, for the vested interest. And I'm really taken by your argument, um, which is so easy to forget that there is, we're heading for incredible, we're, we're in instability already. And the argument that um, green economics um, risks provoking more instability is simply, um, uh, is simply a lie. Uh, because uh, it's, it's Naomi Klein's uh, shock doctrine at work, and we just, we can't see it happening. But you've pointed it out already, and thank you for um, bringing us to a place of greater sense, I think, in, in where, we, where we can begin to find solutions that are more, um, at least are more sustainable, sustainable and stable solutions. Um, so I think we ought to let you go, Molly, and do a bit of gardening or something. Um, <laughs> We, back to bed, I'm afraid. Thanks so bed. much for allowing me to join like this. I really appreciate it. I think we. <laughs>
but also for turning us quite short notice uh, when we have to make some rearrangements of the programme, uh, for persevering uh, to the end and for being such good company uh, to start up our day. Thank you very much, Molly, and we do hope to see you again.